be in the house. Amen. Uh, I would say this. Um, if you show up a little bit late, you might just miss out. Okay. And I'm going to start giving gift cards away in the first five minutes. I'm just kidding. Well, maybe not. All right. Um, but we, we love seeing your beautiful faces. I know sometimes, trust me, with a young family, I get it. Sometimes it's hard to get out. So we love seeing you. It's just, I'll tell you something. It really puts the, Pastor Bernie, you can agree with me, right? It really sets the tone for us going in when we see like a crowd, right? And it really also sets the tone, I think, emotionally for us. We're people when we don't see a crowd, right? But you showed up and we love you. And we're so happy you're here. And it is so great seeing your beautiful faces. Um, we are so excited for what God is doing here at Coast City. Um, and so we'd encourage you to, to be here. One thing that might help you to be here a little earlier is at nine o'clock. Everybody say nine o'clock. I know for some of you, you kind of like, ugh, nine, ugh. But nine o'clock, we have really great Bible studies going on over in the other wing. And you can go and join those. There's a men's group that will be meeting starting next week. There will be a women's group that will be kicking off a new Bible study that we finalize this week. All right. And so that's going to be moving forward. Do not miss that. Do not miss out. Community is important, even if you guys get together and just talk. Uh, that's really a wonderful. Pray with each other, talk with each other, and fundamentally, it'll help you build those relationships. So, so important, all right? So next week, everybody say next week. week. Now say nine o'clock. I'll be there. No, uh, some of you don't want to commit. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Um, but, but try, try. I'll try to be there, okay, at least. All right, I'm, I'm kind of playing. All right, let's pray. Man, the Lord is moving, right? I, oh, I was like this close to just, uh, we'll, we'll just worship. Um, so I'll try to finish so we have a little bit of time uh, afterwards, but uh, we are getting there. So let's pray and let's just seek the Lord to continue talking to us and speaking to us this morning. Lord, we love you and we thank you. God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are still moving in power. You have your miracles and your moving Holy Spirit have not ceased. You are here with us to be our comforter, our counselor, our advocate, our healer. God, our God, you bring revelation from the Lord. You you give your word. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. Can you thank the Holy Spirit right now? Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for being with me. Help, help us, Lord, to hear you more clearly. Speak to our hearts that nobody here would be the same as how they walked in and that we would be changed by you in the name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Amen. Another word that was given today on top of all of the other different things that were happening, somebody shared with me. And by the way, if you feel like you have a word from the Lord, you can come up to me. You can come up to uh, Ratu. You could go up to Pastor Doug. You could go up to Pastor Bernie, but it'd be a little awkward because he's up on stage. Um, but find one of us, talk to us, let us hear, even write out what God is speaking to you so that we might be able to discern if it's the right word at the right time for this group. And then we can allow that to be shared. And that's exactly what happened today because we do believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to people. They are, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is helping to use people to share what, what he has for us. All right. Amen. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I do want to thank Mr. Barron for coming out. Thank you. He'll be running for senator this year, um, or not, yeah, this year in November. And so uh, he'll be running for an independent seat, I believe. Uh, yep. And so if, if you see his name, pray about it. Do your research. Look, I'm not going to advocate anything. I'm just thankful that you decide to come on out. We love your family. We love uh, Nate, who's been a big part of our church for years. And, uh, and so anyway, we just uh, thank you for coming out today. And I just wanted to give that plug. All right. So pray about it and do your research. Amen. And see what God leads you to do. But isn't it great that God is leading people to help serve in, in our church? the politics of our nation that are spirit-led. Amen? And we need to pray for more people who are spirit-led and not led by any other motivations. Amen? 
Okay, that's all I'll say about that. We're not in November yet. I'll revisit a little bit later, okay? But right now, uh, we're going to get into this uh, thing. But I had this word, which I think kind of begins the tie-in. Uh, it was about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the fact that, and I just see these themes running throughout. They were told that they needed to recant or go into the fire, right? And, they, and, and, the, and the word here is, is, it's not really a word, it's just a reminder out of that word of God that says, look, when you go into the fire, they went into the fire, they did it. They said, no matter what, we will not, we will not recant, we will not bow down, we will serve God to the end. Fire or no fire, right? And so they went to the fire, they went into the fire, And that's the point here. They were in the fire. How many of you think sometimes God's going to rescue you from the fire? You know what? Listen, God didn't keep them out of the fire. We've got to remember that. In fact, God allowed them to go right into the hottest fire there was. But he joined them. He was with them. And he held them through it. And they came out of the fire without a single hair on their head being singed. Amen? So listen, we want to pray, God, keep me out of the fire. But sometimes he gives us the fire so he can give us his wonderful provision and presence through it. Amen? All right, with that in mind, we're going to start today's service, and mer- or a, s- a sermon, message, whatever. All right, but that was a word given, and I think that was, that was a great, it was like, but God was with them. Amen? All right. Romans 3, 24 through 25, I will start there, and I'm going to read Galatians 5. We will be jumping all throughout Scripture. Feel free to, uh, f- you know, flip along with us if you can keep up. But there are a lot of questions that were given to me last week. We hit up on a few, and I'm going to kind of carry over a few themes from last week's service. Last week, when we started this You Asked For It series, there were a lot of questions that had to do with the nature of God, how he relates to people, and how he um, views people, especially within the context of their sin and things like that. And so we talked a lot about grace. I cannot rehash that message. You need to go back and listen to it. But I do think that God did a lot of really good things and brought out a lot of things. But one thing that was was brought up that needed a little bit more clarification as we talked as a team. I know I'm going, blah, blah, blah. we're like low on time, so I'm trying to hit this. All right, but, but basically, one of the things that uh, came up that I thought was interesting that I could kind of nail a little bit more and get a little bit more clarification, and I think it does set us up for what I think God has for us the rest of the, the message, but it, it is this, and it's out of Romans 24, and I will try not to mess up this wonderful word that I love so much but don't know how to say. Okay, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption uh, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had uh, passed over the sins that we were previous that we were previously committed. Now here's the deal: this word propitiation. That's twice now. I even got through it. Um, in in that word, I explained what it meant in context, or in, like the concept of it. All right, and I talked about kind of how David and Goliath is an example of how one person. They used to do this. One person would represent the entire army, and the winner of that fight is the one that kind of winner takes all, okay? But, but basically, it's like that, okay, in concept. Jesus was the one that was sent forth, okay? But instead of fighting a battle like what they would have in the olden days, instead, he was set forth as the one, and this is where the clarification comes from last week, and I'm just kind of carrying it on, and that is this, that he carried the wrath of God on him. And that was an important distinction that I don't think I highlighted last week that in our staff we were talking about that I wanted to clarify. That he was the one person set aside, set apart to represent all of us as he lived a perfect life. Raise your hand if you lived a perfect life. Anyone? Right? 
Not me. All right. He did though, and yet he went as a representative for all of us to carry the wrath of God on him. So he took the punishment for all of us, okay? And that's an important distinction. I know we know that, but that's what makes that word so beautiful, that because of what he did, then the wrath of God passes over us, just like the Passover lamb, right? During Passover, they would paint the doorposts of their houses and the, the, the angel that would pass over with judgment did not go to those houses, okay? And so we need to paint the blood of the lamb over our house so that we might be right with God, right? We accept him and then he changes us. And then after we accept Christ... Then we move into a new life. Everybody say new. All right. I have realized as time has gone by that um, this new life, this concept of being a Christian does not go over well with people who have control issues. Anybody who wants to control something has a very hard time. I, I think, I think, can have a very hard time letting go of the old life and letting God take their dreams. Letting God take their future. Why? Because people, especially those who like to control things, they want to what? Control the situation. Control the outcome. Control the people around them. Control things. And look, we're, it's kind of like a, a barometer of, I don't know if barometers, right? Where a scale, whatever you want to use. It, 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 some people are over here on the scale and some are over here. Some people are just kind of controlling and some people over here are incredibly controlling, right? And we're all in different places on that scale, okay? And, and for different things, Right? I might be really controlling in one area, but not in another, okay? And here's the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit. He is trying to help you be like Jesus and trying to help us follow and live in the nature of God. And it's a process we like to call sanctification, okay? It's the process of becoming like Jesus, who was able himself to say, Lord, if you can take this cup, Take it. But if not, your will be done. Right? Right? Our Lord was able to give up control and submit. Submit to the hands of the Roman government. And even as being beaten with the ability and authority to call down angels, even while on the cross, with the ability and authority to call down angels, he still yielded and let go of the control that he could have had all the way to death. And he is the example that we are to be like. When we die to ourselves, he recreates us new and we are on a journey that he has ordained. Therefore, we cannot control it. We cannot force it. We cannot muster the right things. I have people ask me all the time, especially the younger they are, the more they ask, how do I know I'm in God's will? Well, here's the how you know. This is how you know if you're achieving what God's calling you to achieve. Every day, are you drawing close to him? And in doing that every day, he will guide your steps. Period. Period. It is not more complicated than that. And anyone who would say, well, have I gone out of God's will? Am I no longer in his will? Did I leave his will for some reason? And they worry about these things. Let me just, let me just say this. The answer is, are you spending time with Jesus today? Today. Tomorrow. The ne just spend time with him. And in doing so, he's going to create in you a clean heart, a new heart. He will help you to be more like him. Get in the word because you love the word. Because you want to know him. And in that process, we will find ourselves where he wants us to be. He will push us out of our comfort zone. Be assured. 
If you like your comfort zone, maybe being a Christian isn't for you. We want the benefits of heaven, but we don't realize that he has called us for a purpose here on earth. I almost don't love songs and old hymns that talk exclusively about the joys of what heaven will be. Only because, only because it gets us so heavenly minded that we become no earthly good. I am excited about heaven. I am excited about what God's going to have and all of the, the wonderful animals and trees, even the, the meat trees, if you were here last week. God's got it all. But boy, isn't there joy right here that every day there's an adventure that he has called you to. There is a person in a life that he wants you to help know him. Plant a seed, plant a seed. Open a door and plant a seed. Give a little extra tip, plant a seed. You love every day. And that leads us to Galatians 5, which we ended with last week, and I wanted to pick up with. If we want to know the nature of God, this is it. And if you aren't hitting this target, this is what you work for. Verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. You see, we are to be loving. We are to be people of joy. We are to be people of peace, patience, and kindness goodness. We're to be faithful, gentle, and we're to have self-control. It doesn't matter where you are with God right now. Maybe you are a new Christian and you have a lot of things in your life that you've been struggling with to break habits, things like that, relationships. Maybe you've been a Christian for, you know, wise. (laughs) And in that, you may be able to look at your life and say, well, you know, I, I kind of have it together. Let me tell you this. We are still being developed, whether you're here or here, because nobody has mastered these things. Are you always full of joy? <laughs> Do you always have peace? How about in traffic? How's your patience? Right? Right? But the Lord develops us in it. And even if you're in the fire of Northern Virginia traffic, he is with you in the car. He's guiding you. He's giving, he's, he's offering, the Holy Spirit's offering, but we must draw near to him. We must be close to him. You might be wondering, well, pastor, you already kind of talked about this. Well, yes, today I'm hitting on the, the, we talked about the, the nature of God and his grace, right? Toward us. Today, I want to talk to you about the nature of God and grace for each other. How do we treat each other in light of the way he treats us? Okay? And so the questions that were given to me, I took my time just kind of dividing them of where I thought they would fit. And this week we have a handful of questions that were offered that have everything to do with how do I deal with people one way or the other. So we're going to dive in a little bit with some of these. Before I do, I want to, I want to set the stage, uh, which I kind of already have, but I, I kind of want to give this concept because I think it'll be a helpful concept It is one that I've used before, but it's a good reminder as we go along. So here it is. Um, There is, in our walk with God, two realities. Even in the nature of God, there are two realities. There's his justice and his truth, right? And then there's his love and his mercy, his grace. And so we, we see it in scripture as what? Grace and truth. Truth and grace. Now, What I've found is many people lean in one or the other. 
I think some people lean a little bit more in truth. And some people lead a little bit more into grace. Another word, or another words we could you put it is judgment or mercy. Okay, some people lean a little bit more in the judgment side. Don't raise your hand. Some lean a little bit more in the mercy side. An example would be, oh, that person. They're doing this, 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 and that, that, and the other, blah, 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 blah. I don't even think they're a Christian. That'd be a judgment side, extreme. The other side is the mercy side. Oh, this person does this, 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 and that, blah, blah, blah. But it's okay, Jesus loves them. They can do whatever they want, it doesn't matter. Grace. Then there's that side. Both at their extremes are unhealthy. Both at their extremes are very unhealthy. I think we do live in a culture now that's extremely high grace, even outside of the church. Unless you disagree with high grace. <laughs> then all of a sudden you get thrown into a high judgment situation. It is like a rope bridge. And you're crossing this great chasm that is life. The rope on your left should be truth. The rope on your right should be grace. And you navigate through life holding the rope of grace and truth. Truth and grace. Without both, it will not be a stable bridge to walk on. Does this make sense? And it is in that context that I want to kind of start diving into some of these questions. First one is this. And, and I didn't know, you have to understand, I'm, uh, there's some context written underneath some of these questions, and I don't know the context. I didn't know who it was or any of that. So I'm going to just kind of try to lean in a little bit with it. But here it is. How do you handle family judgment? I don't know exactly what that meant. I, I didn't think, I didn't know if that was judgment on you or judgment on others. But either way, the concept of judgment, I'll go ahead and read, um, read through some verses and give some thoughts in general, because I think there's another question that lines up similarly. And so we'll be kind of um, trying to overlap some of these. But John 13, 34, it says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. The next uh, verse I have, and, and here it kind of goes, it, it continues on. So I want to I want to continue. I'm going to loop them together and I'll kind of answer all these together. How can you trust someone that you're having a hard time forgiving? Right? And that's a pretty common question that I get a lot of times. How do you trust somebody that you have a hard time forgiving? And then here's the next one that goes along with all of that. How do we forgive something that you can't forget to let go and, and let God have it? So how do you forget something that may have happened to you? How can you forgive it if, and let it go when it's something that you, you can't seem to forget? Like, what's, what do you do with that? And so I'm going to read some more verses and we're going to continue on and then I'll, I'll answer the best I can. Matthew 6, 15, it says, but if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. That's Jesus. If you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. This isn't the Pastor Dustin quote, okay? It's Jesus. <laughs> Ephesians, so don't get mad at me and I don't want any emails. All right, now about that. Ephesians 4, 32. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Mark eleven twenty five. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. We see in other places of scripture where Paul writes and he says, you know, make allowances for each other's faults, 
okay? We do live in a society that is very much uh, a, uh, if you wrong me, you're dead to me society. That's where we are. If you make me feel uncomfortable, you're toxic. Let me, let me just say this. There's a balance. Tr- truth and grace, okay? We've, we've got to walk in a balance. Now, first of all, when talking about forgiveness, I, I want to kind of get into this just quickly because I don't have a lot of time. When talking about forgiveness, we must understand this. Jesus forgave you. Therefore, we are obligated to forgive others. You do not have the freedom as a Christian to hold grudges. You lost that freedom. You lost that right. If you want to keep that right, you can go back to not being a Christian. Okay? Therefore, how do you forgive? You've got to allow the Holy Spirit to first deal with your heart and then you have to verbally forgive the people around you. If they're dead and gone, you've got to verbally communicate it to God. You've got to say, God, help me to forgive. God, I forgive them for what they did. And you begin to start speaking it out. If they're on earth and you have the opportunity You have got to go to them and talk to them and say, listen, I'm sorry for anything I've done and I want you to know that I'm letting go of all of the discord that we have. Now listen, do not use this as a tool to say I'm getting back at you by telling you all the things that you've done wrong by saying I forgave you. I forgive you for looking at me wrong. I forgive you for this and that and the other. Listen, that is not what the deal is. The deal is in your heart, you have to allow God to help you understand what forgiveness is. And if you can't get there because the wrong has been so great to you, you must go to scripture and you must go to Christ and you must be reminded of the great cost he paid for you so that you would be forgiven. Now, if somebody is active in your life and they are harming you in some way, you must remove yourself from that in order to be able to find the healing and forgiveness you need. If you are in that situation, you cannot remain in that situation and find healing and forgiveness. You've got to say, God, help me to remove myself. But I think also we have to understand, and this is a fine line here, Sometimes people try to help other people. And in doing so, they hurt other people. You with me? And you have to be able to say, okay, is this enough? What kind of hurt is this? What, what happened here? Was I in the wrong? Was there even a part of me that was in the wrong? What can I own? How can I grow? And you begin to start evaluating the situation. And you say, listen, God, help me. Please, Lord, help me. And I need you, church, hear me on this. You need to be able to identify, are you hurt because they called you out on something that you needed to be called out on? Or are you hurt because they hurt you? And that's the first step. And then remove yourself if you can. For for example, you might have a boss that is very hurtful to you. No, they're helping you be a better employee. They just don't know how to, they don't have good people skills, right? And let me ask you, do you always have good people skills? In the right situation, we can all come off wrong. We've got to be able to make allowances for other people's faults. Do you hear me on this? Part of forgiving is understanding where people are coming from. A big burden I had for a long time was forgiving my father. I did not know how to do that until God gave me a vision of him as a child and how he was treated by his father. When I saw that vision, God confirmed in my heart what I needed to do is to love my dad and I viewed him completely different from then on through, a, through, through the nature of grace. Okay, so if you want to find breakthrough in your life and let go of the baggage, you've got to learn to forgive and let it go. You've got to. 
You learn from it. You grow from it. It doesn't mean you have to trust that person again. Another question in here had to do with trust. How do you, how do you bring people back into trust? Do you just forgive them and forget everything and you just trust them again? No. You Listen, look, if you hurt somebody, you're going to have to earn your trust back with them. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean you haven't forgiven them. But there is, you have to allow them the opportunity to earn that trust back. Okay? I think that's a big problem. We don't allow for people to come back from it. We've got to give grace because he gave us grace, okay? Spent more time than I wanted to on that, but it's an important thing. So let's move on. What's the best way to handle uh, anger and frustration? Ephesians 4, 3, uh, 31 through 32, uh, 31, 32 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, uh, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just uh, as God through Christ has forgiven you. Again, how do we not find anger, bitterness, and rage? We look at Christ and what he did for us. There is nothing that will soften a heart faster than thinking of the cross. You with me? Somebody cut you off? Lord, thank you for the cross. Come on. If that's not a practical tool, I Somebody makes you mad at work. Somebody makes you mad in life. Somebody does something. If, if you just habitually get angry, we have these pathways in our minds. I talk about this. It's a, it's a neurological thing, and I think it lines up with Scripture. When the, when the Word of God says we need to be renewed in our mind by the Word of God, I think that this it speaks to this. This idea that habits happen in our lives when you were very young. Somebody hurt you. Somebody did something to you. And as a result, you found a way to deal with it. You hid and you, you maybe put up walls or maybe you fought it out, right? Who's a fighter in the room? Raise your, don't raise your hand. Who's a hider? A flighter? Anybody? Flighters are like, I don't, I'm flighting. I'm not raising my hand. I got a few. I got a few. And here's the deal. The way you respond at a young age will be like a path. Have you ever gone hiking? Have you ever gone off the path and made your own and got lost in the woods? Anybody? Anybody ever say, look, I know how this trail goes. <laughs> I know how this road goes. I think there's a shortcut. Anybody ever go with the shortcut? <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a shortcut person. <laughs> Eventually, if you keep taking the shortcut over and over again, guess what? It's no longer a shortcut. It's just the way to go. Right? That's what alcohol does. It was a shortcut at some point of getting out of my frustration and my stress. But now it's the way to go. Right? Smoking's that way too. It was a shortcut. It was a way to fit in. It was a way to do this. And it was a shortcut. And now it's not a shortcut. It's not an unmarked path. It's the way I go. Pornography, same thing. I'm frustrated. I'm annoyed. I've got other influences. I've got imagery and all of this. And it is no longer a shortcut. It's the way I go. And it is destroying families. Alcohol destroys families. Love of money destroys families. Lives. Because the pathways have become unhealthy. We must chart new pathways through the word of God to help chart out how we deal with things. Some people you get angry right away. Because that's been your shortcut. You've got to die to that. You've got to learn that there's another way. And the best way to do that is to go to the cross. To go to the word. To go to the presence of God in those moments. Take a breath. If you're upset with somebody and they're another believer, you need to go to them. You need to love them. And you need to pray with them. You get upset with your spouse or 
or, or, or another relationship, friendship, anything, and, and you're, you're in discord with each other because you're angry or because something happened, you, you need to come together and you need to pray together. Pray together. It will change the dynamic of those relationships. I'm just giving you tools. You can take them or leave them. James 1, 19 through 20. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce righteousness. God desires. Matthew 5, 22. But I say, this is Jesus, even or if you are even angry with somebody, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Matthew 5, 7, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Another question that I think moves into the final thought that I have overall, and I know we're running late. We went a little long with worship, so please have a little bit of grace with me. What would Jesus say about the death sentence? That is a big question. Because, again, we look at truth and grace, judgment and mercy, right? We do not totally give up the law. In fact, Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. He made the standards even harder. And regardless spiritually of any sin, the penalty is death. That's why we go to Jesus as our propitiation, right? So I'm not going to give a clear answer on this. This is one of those where it says, you know what? There's room. There's room because... I want, to set, I, want to, I want to give another distinction because then it goes into the next couple of questions. The world is the world and the church is the church. You with me? We do not, we help influence policy and different things through politics and votes and things like that. But at the end of the day, our job is to be Christ followers. And the word of God is written for you and for me. And I'm going to be careful how I word this, but I need you to understand the heart of what I'm saying. The word also is available to the non-believer. It is accessible. And for a seeker that the Holy Spirit is trying to draw in, the word of God is for them. Do you understand? That is true. But, but let me give you this. The rules and laws and the standards by which we live are found in the word of God. And the world outside of the body of Christ, they do not understand that standard. They cannot be held to that standard. Do you understand me? It was not written to condemn the world. That's not the context the word was written to help us know what was right and what was wrong, that under the umbrella of God, those who are seeking him, we know what to and what not to do. Do you understand? And the world will never understand it because they have given themselves over to the flesh. But we die to the flesh, and now we give ourselves over to the Spirit, which leads us through the Word as to how we are to live. So for me to say to somebody, you're going to hell because you did this, this, and this, while that may be true, it's kind of irrelevant because everybody's going to hell that didn't accept Jesus. So why would I tell them everything they're doing wrong? Why not just tell them that Jesus loves them? And help them to know Jesus. And then allow for the Holy Spirit to change them after they accept Christ. Well, pastor, that's like a switch, bait and switch. Yes. Yes. Salvation's free. Salvation is free. For everyone. But then we live a life different. Because we're recreated. New. You right? You with me? We're all together? 
So this concept of judgment is an interesting concept. It isn't your job or mine to judge whether or not somebody is going to heaven or going to hell. And it isn't our job as a church family to sentence one another to hell. The moment you tell somebody that they're a sinner in the room and they love Jesus is the moment you are sentencing them to hell. But guess what? They accepted Jesus. So what you say means nothing because they're covered by the blood. We ought not judge one another because Jesus is the judge. God's the one that sits on the throne of judgment, not you, praise God. And not me, praise the Lord. All of you should clap for that, you know. But, you know, at the end of the day, here's the, here's the deal. Your job is what? Help people know they're wrong? <laughs> no. Your job is what, church? No, love God. And what's the second part? Love people. Love God, love people. All of the commandments are boiled down to those two. Love God and love people. Church, I have other questions. I've been told I'm too rigid in following God's requirements. Should I be less rigid? That goes hand in hand with this. Truth and grace. We need to be able to live holy, right lives. Holy does not mean perfect. It means set apart. Right? I know I'm going long and I'm sorry. But I just feel like this is so important for you. That we, we must live lives that spur one another on. The church for so many years, and I've said it before, is the only army that shoots its own wounded. Gosh, I see it so quickly in our church, even in the bigger church, like the assemblies and things like that. They were just so quick to just say, you're done. As soon as somebody missteps or does something somebody else doesn't like, and that is not biblical. Does that mean we don't help people who are struggling with things in their lives? Of course we help people who are struggling with things in their lives. But don't you dare, dare do it if you don't love them first and if you don't have a relationship with them first because you have no voice into their life. If you are not, it, look, God will put people in your path for you to be close to for the purpose of you helping them. And look, and I'm talking to you as somebody who's a judger. I'll be honest. I naturally tell everybody else how to do their job in my mind. Is there, is there anybody else who's kind of like that? You just, you just know how to do their job better than them? Always? <laughs> I'm, I'm wrapping up, I promise, and we'll pray and dismiss. Here's the deal. We must, we must <laughs> learn to spur each other on. Lift each other up. The negative talk needs to stop. And the positive talk needs to go up. And if you're going to deal with something that somebody, look, my kids make mistakes and I have to deal with that. Do I smack them on the butt and tell them they're horrible? No. Do I want to sometimes? <laughs> but what I ought to do and what I try to do is say, I love you. I believe in you. I care about you so much. I see this thing. And if you keep following this thing and you keep going down this road in your personality, in your situation, you're going to find yourself in a bad place. And I love you so much. I don't want that for you. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. The heart of it all should always be I love you and I want to help you. I want to help you. So how do we deal with people? We deal with people with love, with truth and grace. We want to give truth, but we must also give grace. We want to say, this isn't great, but oh, you are so loved. Do you understand? And if you think you know how to do somebody's job better than them, go ahead and do their job. Serve alongside of them. 
And by your efforts, maybe they will catch some new skills that you can help them with. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut. Tip a little extra and tell them God loves you and mean it. (laughs) And remember that the heavenly father whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you accordingly to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. Right? Let's stand together and let me pray. If the Lord is speaking to you in some way right now about how you may deal with people around you, would you lift up a hand? Because let me tell you, he's speaking to me. My hand's up. Join me if God is speaking to you. And let's pray together. I'm, in fact, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Lord Jesus. Come on, church. Lord Jesus. I give you my life. I give you control. I ask you to help me. To love people. To forgive people. Help me to let go. And let you lead me. And may I be used by you. Jesus name. Amen. I love you church. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful Sunday.